Australian leaders and citizens feared Japan's rise as a major power in East Asia. After World War I, the Australian government was opposed to Japan being rewarded with former German colonies in the Pacific Ocean. The Australians failed in this regard, but they did prod the Allies into rejecting Japan's insistence on a declaration of racial equality to be included in the Covenant and the League of Nations. Australian fears also played a part in the end of the Anglo-Japanese alliance in 1923, which had been a cornerstone of East Asian diplomacy since 1902. In addition to tensions over power politics and racism, Japanese fishermen often worked illegally in Australian waters, which led to some arrests. The two nations had a poor relationship that only worsened after Japan attacked China in 1937. The Australian town most under threat of Japanese attack was Darwin. It was the largest settlement in Northern Territory, Australia's most wild and remote region. Its meager economy was mostly based on mining and pearl diving. The population was diverse and included Chinese, Greeks, and Aboriginals in addition to Australian nationals. It boasted an excellent natural harbor and its proximity to the Dutch East Indies made it strategically valuable. Darwin was seen as Australia's first line of defense and the best spot from which Australian forces could assist in the defense of the Dutch East Indies. In the 1920s, the Australian military built fuel tanks and fortifications at Darwin. In 1938, Darwin was converted into a military base. Airstrips and port facilities were expanded. However, even as war with Japan loomed, Darwin's defenses were still insufficient. Australia was in a panic after Japan declared war and their aircraft sank the British battleship Prince of Wales in the battlecruiser Repulse on December 10, 1941, off the coast of Malaya. Australian Prime Minister John Curtin declared, This is the gravest hour of our history. We Australians have imperishable traditions. We shall maintain them. We shall vindicate them. We shall hold this country and keep it as a citadel for the British-speaking race and as a place where civilization will persist. Despite Japan's early victories, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill and President Franklin Roosevelt decided upon a strategy of defeating Germany first, a prospect which angered Curtin. His relations with Churchill were already tense, and he felt abandoned by the mother country. On December 26, 1941, Curtin said, We refuse to accept the dictum that the Pacific struggle must be treated as a subordinate segment of the general conflict. Roosevelt and Churchill believed that Curtin was panicking, but his fears were not hyperbolic. Australia was unprepared to resist a major attack. In addition, only two weeks before the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Australian cruiser Sydney was sunk by the Germans off the coast of Shark Bay with all hands lost. The already small Royal Australian Navy was insufficient to counter any major Japanese attack on Australia. If the Dutch East Indies, New Guinea, or New Caledonia fell, Australia could come under direct attack. As such, Australian ground, air, and naval forces were deployed to defend each location. Darwin acted as a forward base for aircraft and ships supporting the defense of the Dutch East Indies. In addition to Australian forces, American troops, ships, and aircraft bound for the Dutch East Indies went through Darwin. It was a vital link in the Allies' desperate attempt to stop Japanese expansion in the Southwest Pacific. Command of Darwin fell to Major General David V.J. Blake. He fought in the Australian Flying Corps in World War I and was responsible for arranging the burial of Manfred von Richthofen. He bickered with the Australian Naval Commander, Captain Edward P. Thomas, who was known for his arrogance and use of harsh discipline. Neither man properly prepared Darwin to resist an air attack, and the Australian air staff was never properly organized. In the Japanese high command, it was feared that Allied forces at Darwin would interfere with the planned invasion of Timor. Japan's first strategy to deal with Darwin was a submarine offensive but the loss of the submarine I-124 caused the Navy to reevaluate its approach. The Japanese also wrongly believed an American aircraft carrier was based out of Darwin. Rear Admiral Taimon Yamaguchi, Japan's most aggressive carrier commander, suggested that Darwin be attacked by carrier aircraft and sent the recommendation to Vice Admiral Nobutaki Kondo. 
who commanded all Japanese naval forces attacking the Dutch East Indies. Kondo agreed that he wanted the air raid to sink Allied ships, destroy aircraft, and wreck the base's facilities. The Japanese sent four of their biggest carriers to attack Darwin. The Akagi, Kaga, Hiryu, and the Soryu. They were commanded by Vice Admiral Chiuchi Nagumo. Although in command of the most powerful carrier group in the world, Nagumo was not an advocate of carriers before the war. He was instead considered Japan's foremost expert on surface torpedo tactics. His appointment to command of the carriers was meant to sate his friend Admiral Osami Nagano, who headed the Navy General Staff. This was done over the objections of Nagano's rival, Admiral Isaruku Yamamoto, who commanded the actual battle fleet. Nagumo and Yamamoto had a tense relationship because they were part of different factions within the Navy. Before the war, Yamamoto supported aircraft development and better relations with the West. Nagumo opposed both. To make matters worse, Nagumo had to work with Yamaguchi, who was a Yamamoto favorite. Yamaguchi and Nagumo argued during the planning of the raid on Pearl Harbor, and Yamaguchi even assaulted Nagumo. Unsurprisingly, Yamaguchi suggested the Darwin raid to Kondo, bypassing his own commander. Although not a great carrier tactician, Nagumo was popular among the many commanded. He was by nature outgoing, loved the sea, and had a sharp sense of humor, although his temper was short. Nagumo leaned heavily on officers such as Minoru Genda, Mitsuo Fuchida, Tashige Agusa, Shigeru Aitaya, and Ryonosuke Kusaka. Genda was slated to plan the attack on Darwin, and he was Japan's leading carrier tactician, having planned Pearl Harbor. Fuchida would lead the aircraft in the attack on Darwin. He was a superb air commander and led attack formations in China before commanding the air attack on Pearl Harbor. Nagumo's pilots were experienced and well-trained. They flew the vaunted A6M fighter, known as the Zero or the Zeke. It was maneuverable and had a long range, although it was not a robust airplane. The D3A, or the VAL, was the Navy's dive bomber. It was maneuverable and handled well, but it did not carry a heavy bomb load. The B-5N, or the Kate, was a bomber that could perform both torpedo and level bombing attacks. It was aging by 1942, but in the hands of men like Fuchida, it was a formidable weapon. On February 9, 1942, Kondo ordered Nagumo to attack Darwin on February 19th, concurrent with the landings at Timor. Several air reconnaissance flights succeeded in giving Genda accurate information on Allied dispositions. In addition, Japan had detailed maps of the area because before the war, Japanese sailors were hired by local Australian authorities to create charts. As Nagumo's carriers approached, Darwin was completely unprepared. The town's aerial defense was its weakest point. The Australian anti-aircraft crews were inexperienced and too few in number. All Australian aircraft were down for repairs. The Americans had only 10 P-40 Kitty Hawk fighter planes from the 33rd Pursuit Squadron, led by veteran pilot Major Floyd J. Pell. The P-40 was a good airplane, rugged and well-armed, and in the hands of experienced pilots, it could take on the Zero. However, the pilots were green and using dogfighting tactics that played directly into Japanese hands. On the morning of February 19th, Fuchida led 188 aircraft, the single largest attack wave of carrier aircraft up to that time. In addition, the carrier attack was supported by long-range bombers piloted by veteran crews. The aircraft used the G3M and G4M, both of which suffer from poor armor. Yet, they would have the advantage of numbers with some 54 bombers. They would strike after Fuchida had hit Darwin, hopefully when Allied defenses were in disarray. As Fuchida's aircraft flew to Darwin, they shot down a PBY Catalina flying boat before it could report their presence. A radio station at the Sacred Heart Catholic Mission on the Tiwi Islands was also destroyed. But Father John McGrath did send a report to Darwin that read, Big flight of planes passed over going south, very high. Wing Commander Sturtebourg Griffith of the Australian Air Force saw the message, but assumed that McGrath had sighted American fighters. Griffith was still not worried. Darwin was not warned in time and caught unprepared. As 
the Japanese approached, one of Pell's pilots radioed zero, zero, zeros. Three P-40s were quickly downed. The Japanese, though, did a loop and approached from the southeast to confuse their prey. It seemed to work since the alarm was not sounded even after the P-40s were downed. Tom Anderson, an American mechanic, exclaimed, Oh boy, look at those reinforcements. We're finally getting a carrier out here. Anderson started counting them until he noticed the red sun insignia. Australian gunner Jack Mulholland said, The sky seemed to be full of white crosses. Enemy planes looked like a well-ordered cemetery advancing across a blue field. The first bombs fell at 9.58 a.m. and destroyed the docks, killing 21 workers almost instantly. Anti-aircraft fire was ineffective and sporadic and could not stop the Japanese as they swarmed over Darwin. One bomb detonated the ammunition stored aboard the transport Neptuna, which engulfed the harbor in smoke and flames. The post office was bombed, killing most of the workers. Bomber Takeshi Maeda declared, after we dropped our bombs, I thought the city of Darwin was completely blown away. Civilians and soldiers alike gathered on the heights overlooking the port and surveyed the damage. Afterwards, the area became known as Survivor's Point. Uchida's main target was the ships, and there were over 60 different vessels in Darwin, mostly transports and luggers. Not among them was the American cruiser Houston, which left days earlier to guard a convoy bound for Timor. The only major warship was the Peary, which was an outdated Clemson-class American destroyer. Peary started the war in the Philippines and was bombed in the war's opening days. Its commander, Lieutenant Commander John M. Birmingham, was sent to the ship only minutes before he was supposed to leave for America. He soon won the respect of the crew and managed to get the ship out of the Philippines by disguising it with palm trees. Since the start of the war, Fury had survived a collision, repeated aerial attacks by Japan, and a friendly fire incident. Fury was in Darwin because a lack of fuel forced it to leave the Houston. The Japanese attacked every major ship in the harbor, but Fury received the most attention. The destroyer took five bomb hits, which blew up the ship, killing Birmingham instantly. Lieutenant Owen Griffiths of the Australian Navy said, the Peary's crew fought to the last. She finally pointed her nose up to the sky and disappeared in a ball of black oily smoke with her machine guns firing to the bitter end. In total, 91 sailors died aboard the Peary out of a crew of 108. One of the few survivors was Ben Greer, who was rescued almost one hour after the attack. When pulled aboard the Australian Light Transport Southern Cross, he was told, Don't worry, come on down below. We're having a birthday party. Greer was served cake and later said, I like those guys, and I knew I'd like Australians. Greer ended up marrying a local woman. The Australian airfield was also wrecked, but not before the men managed to down one vow. Meanwhile, Pell got the rest of his fighters into the air. He was killed by a zero. Lieutenant Jack Pierce was also shot down, but his location was not found until months later. By then, he was a skeleton and could only be identified by his watch. The only American not shot down was Lieutenant Robert Ostriker, who claimed he downed one vow, although that is unlikely. For gamely taking on such terrible odds, all 10 fighter pilots were awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. Five of those awards were posthumous. Fuchida signaled his aircraft to depart at around 10.30 a.m. However, a few were seriously damaged and did not make it, including a Zero piloted by Hajime Toyoshima. He got as far as Melville Island before he made a forced landing. He was captured days later by young Aboriginal men. His plane was the first complete Zero in Allied hands, and Toyoshima was one of the first Japanese naval pilots to become a prisoner of war in the Pacific Theater. In 1944, he led a failed mass prison break and died in the attempt. On the return to the carrier's Fuchida, spotted the transport Don Isidro near Bathurst Island. Nagumo ordered a follow-up attack that sank both Don Isidro and the transport Florence D. Both ships were mostly crewed by Filipinos, and most of the men survived by swimming to Bathurst Island. At noon, the land-based aircraft attacked. They completed the destruction of the Australian airfield and suffered no losses, save one lightly damaged bomber. It was among the most successful long-range Japanese air raids of the entire war. 
Total Japanese losses were five aircraft destroyed with 48 damaged, although most of the damage was light. By contrast, the Allies lost 27 aircraft, 11 ships were sunk, and another 28 damaged. Port facilities were in shambles. In the chaos, there was looting and even rape. Hundreds of Australian personnel deserted in the weeks after. Total Allied deaths are still debated, but casualties including desertions and wounded would place the number of losses above 1,000. Curtin publicly admitted that Darwin had been attacked. He declared, the government regards the attacks as most grave, and it makes it quite clear that a severe blow has been struck on Australian soil. Blake was blamed for the disaster and sent to a rear command in Australia. For Curtin, the destruction of Darwin was doubly bad since thousands of Australians had only days before been captured in Singapore. Although the Japanese were disappointed to find few major ships in the harbor, the attack knocked out Darwin as a base in 1942. As such, the Allies' ability to reinforce the Dutch East Indies took a mortal blow. To make matters worse, around 60,000 military personnel were placed at Darwin to stop an invasion if it ever came. Unknown to the Allies, the Japanese army turned down the Navy's tentative plans for an invasion days before the attack on Darwin, with Prime Minister Hideki Tojo calling it so much gibberish. Among the few to support an invasion was Tomoyuki Yamashita, the victor at Singapore. However, he was a rival of Tojo's, and his support did nothing to advance the scheme. The mere threat of invasion tied up considerable Allied forces. Curtin in particular refused to send Australian troops to Burma, and the colony was captured in April 1942. Lastly, the Allies had to spend years rebuilding Darwin, which made an Allied offensive into the Dutch East Indies impossible until 1944. All in all, the attack on Darwin was among Japan's biggest tactical and strategic victories of World War II. The attack on February 19th was only the first of several raids that plagued Darwin throughout 1942 and 1943 with the last raid occurring on November 12, 1943. During the years after the attack, a large airfield complex was built and the Allies conducted a strategic bombing campaign of the Dutch East Indies and New Guinea. Large underground oil storage facilities were also built after above-ground stores were destroyed in the summer of 1942. Darwin was rebuilt after the war, only to be destroyed by Cyclone Tracy in 1974. The city was then rebuilt again and it is still the biggest in the Northern Territory. Some of its buildings still have bullet holes from the war, and every February 19th, an alarm is sounded at 9.58 a.m. to remind the city's citizens of the events of 1942. In 1959, Ryogo Fujita, a pacifist who deplored Japan's war in World War II, salvaged a number of the wartime wrecks in Darwin Harbor. Fujita saw the salvage as a way to repair relations between Japan and the people of Darwin. He even raised some of the wrecks for free, and in his honor, a propeller from the American transport Meigs was placed at his grave in Ashia. One wreck that remained, though, was the Piri. Considered a war grave, a few items were raised by Carl Atkinson, a local diver. Fujita also cleared out parts that blocked the harbor, but left the rest. Among the items raised by Atkinson was a single cannon, in 1992, it was placed in Bicentennial Park as a monument to the men who lost their lives in the hopeless struggle to defend Darwin. Its gun is pointed towards Peary's final resting place in Darwin Harbor. <laughs> <laughs>